The Fermi Paradox Part 21 Illuminating the Alien Arguably the most famous attempt to plot the path taken by a society from technology to virtual magic is the Kardashev scale. Nikolai Kardashev, currently deputy director of Moscow's Astro Space Center, conducted the Soviet Union's first SETI program in 1963. However, he realized that in order for a civilization to produce radio signals on par with those of the galaxy, and thus detectable by us, such beings would have to be able to manipulate energy levels far in excess of human capabilities. In 1964, he developed a yardstick for quantifying the technological development of a hyper-advanced civilization based on energy consumption. Type 1 Kardashev defined a Type 1 civilization as having an energy consumption level close to our own, at 4 trillion watts per year. This figure has been criticized as too conservative, since global energy consumption is now 1.5 trillion watts per year, and we are likely to surpass that number within 40 years. A more recent formulation defines a Type 1 civilization as one capable of harnessing energy equivalent to that which the Earth receives annually from the Sun, giving a more distant figure of between 10 and 100 quadrillion watts per year, or up to 60,000 times our current usage. Type 2. A Type 2 civilization is capable of harnessing all the energy produced by its star, equivalent to 400 septillion watts per year for a star like the Sun. Type 3. A Type 3 civilization will be able to harness the energy equivalent of our entire galaxy, or 40 undecillion watts per year. In case you are wondering, an undecillion is a one with 36 zeros after it. Initially, Kardashev made no actual predictions as to what such civilizations would be able to accomplish with their power. He was only interested in how it applied to radio communication. Scientists, science popularizers, and science fiction writers, on the other hand, have had a field day, dreaming all manner of cosmic engines and monuments. Science broadcaster Michio Kaku, who has done much to popularize the Kardashev scale in recent years, argues that a Type 1 civilization would have enough energy to control weather, moderate plate tectonics to control earthquakes and volcanoes, and build cities on the ocean floor. To describe a Type 2 civilization, Kaku turned to one of the great visionaries of modern physics, Freeman Dyson. Dyson's scientific work is notable in itself. He has a pattern of electromagnetic waves, the Dyson series, named after him but he is best known for his explorations into the possible future paths that might be taken by intelligence. In 1979, he plotted the final course of entropy in an open universe, and speculated how intelligence could adapt and survive over thousands of trillions of years. But it was a short paper in 1960, written in response to Caccioni and Morrison's SETI spawning paper a year earlier, for which Dyson is chiefly known. In it, he proposed that a hyper-advanced civilization could convert a mass of matter equivalent to Jupiter into a 2-3 to three meter thick shell in orbit around a star. Such a shell would then be able to harvest and utilize all the star's energy, creating a default Type II civilization. Despite initially calling it a shell, Dyson envisioned this structure as a swarm of independent islands, each with a continent-sized population, as a true shell around a star is structurally impossible. He nevertheless argued that such structures would be visible in the infrared, and that wide-scale infrared surveys might be able to detect them. Today, these hypothetical megastructures are known as Dyson spheres. A Type III civilization, Michio Kaku argues, would be capable of generating energy levels found only at the time of the Big Bang. This would enable them, potentially, to cut open the fabric of space-time and reshape it to their liking, creating wormholes that enable rapid transit through the galaxy. Colonization would be aided by so-called von Neumann probes, self-replicating machines that could land on dead asteroids or moons and consume their materials, using them to copy themselves by the thousand, spreading exponentially through the galaxy in as little as half a million years, inventorying every habitable planet as they go. Von Neumann probes may even evolve as they reproduce, perhaps to the point of sentience. Some thinkers on the outer edges of SETI have suggested that searching for von Neumann probes in our own solar system in a similar manner to the astronauts finding the monolith on the moon in the movie 2001, might be a faster route to first contact than sifting through radio signals. However, the existence of von Neumann probes 
has been challenged on the same grounds on which Hart challenged the existence of intelligence itself. Enough time has passed for the entire galaxy not only to have been reached by von Neumann probes, but to have been completely consumed by them, down to the last wisp of hydrogen. We're still here. There have been several attempts to speculate on what traces a Type Three civilization might leave in its wake, and whether we could detect them. In 1992, Kardashev himself speculated on the potential fingerprints of a Type Three civilization. He suggested that their structures might be in the order of a hundred kiloparsecs across, roughly the size of the Milky Way, and so could be visible across entire galaxies out to a distance of millions of light years. Such structures would be far colder than the surrounding stars, ranging from as cold as intergalactic space to room temperature on Earth. Like Dyson spheres, such structures would be visible primarily in the infrared region of the spectrum. Unfortunately, bar a few narrow frequencies, infrared astronomy is largely impossible from the ground. Our atmosphere, as anyone familiar with global warming knows, absorbs infrared very well, and so pointing an infrared telescope at the sky would be like pointing an optical one at a tar pit. Recently, however, a number of space-borne infrared telescopes have been launched, such as IRAS, Spitzer, and most importantly, WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, which have conducted exhaustive surveys of the night sky at these wavelengths from their perch above the obscuring atmosphere. Over the years, there have been several attempts to comb their data for evidence of Dyson spheres, but none have proven successful. In 2015, a group of researchers at Penn State University conducted a data survey of 100,000 galaxies observed by the WISE telescope, searching for evidence of galaxy-spanning Type III civilizations. They based their search on the principle that, no matter how advanced a culture's technology, it would still have to obey the second law of thermodynamics. Any energy it consumed would have to be re-radiated as waste heat, otherwise known as infrared radiation. The team argued that, far from being proof that we are alone in the universe, Hart's argument led only to two possible outcomes. Given the short time needed for pan-colonization, either our galaxy is full to bursting with alien intelligence, or other galaxies must be. To assume otherwise is to assume that we are, as a species, privileged. They rejected the idea of the Dyson Sphere, on the basis that constructing such an object would be vastly more costly and time-consuming than interstellar travel. Our farthest space probes are only a few thousand times closer than our nearest star, but our solar energy coverage is currently 100 quadrillion times below total capture. The survey, called Glimpsing Heat from Alien Technologies, or GAT, searched primarily for excess infrared as a proportion of the light from the stars in a galaxy, which would be the energy available to a Type III civilization. The end result was that no excess heat was found greater than 85% the energy of the stars, and out of the 100,000 galaxies studied, only 50 produced results that could not be immediately ruled out. The end result of the survey, in the opinion of its conductors, was that Type III civilizations, as Kardashev defined them, do not exist, at least in the region observed by Wise. The Penn State survey is notable for its commendably bottom-up approach. Unlike traditional SETI, it relies solely on physical laws and makes no assumptions as to the motives and intentions of any potential interstellar neighbors. And yet, as Jason Wright, one of the conductors of the survey, noted, it is in danger of searching for an alien of the gaps, appealing to intelligent design simply because you cannot explain an observation naturally. But more profoundly, like all SETI projects, the survey still employs assumptions based on the technological development of beings incomprehensibly more advanced than we are. Science fiction author Carl Schroeder has modified Clark's law to state that any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from nature, that rather than grinding nature down and overpowering it with mechanical force, as we do, a more advanced civilization would seek ever more efficient use of its resources, and so would seek to emulate nature's superficially more chaotic, but fundamentally more efficient functionality. In short, for all its methodological virtue, the Penn State survey was painting these hyper-advanced beings like ourselves, just as the Tannese did. Even Sagan, who was happy to give very human motivations to every alien culture he conceived, noted in his response to Hart, quote, The manifestations of very advanced civilizations would be no more apparent to us than the design and function of human engineering artifacts 
are to ants crawling upon their surfaces. Unquote. Let me be clear once again. I believe that SETI is science. And I also believe, just as Caccioni and Morrison did nearly 60 years ago, that it is a worthwhile endeavor. But it is also worth quoting Clark's first law. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is probably wrong. SETI, by attempting to second-guess the actions and achievements of an alien race, effectively places limits on the possible. This is understandable, because without limits or barriers, everything becomes possible, and science loses its ability to explain and predict, collapsing into a morass of the miraculous. But again, science is least comfortable when forced to view the world from the top down, and with steadily advancing bottom-up projects like Kepler encroaching on its territory, one wonders if it will ultimately be SETI that will offer the final answer to Fermi's perplexing question. It's been a long road, but if you hang around for the final chapter, I have a few more things to show you. Mm-hmm.